this episode is another Ask Karen Anything episode where I will answer two questions from students in my video classroom. One is about helping a horse to maintain the canter better because he breaks frequently. And the other question is about a horse who gets bulky and kind of stops and shuts down. So without further ado, let's get started. Episode 12, Ask Karen Anything. Hi, I'm Karen Rolfe, and welcome to Horse Training in Harmony. This podcast is about you making progress with your horse in a way that you both can love. It's about learning how to move and be in harmony, because yes, you really can develop a horse to be both athletic and happy. When we show up as our best selves for our horses, our horses will show up for us. So let's get started. I love doing these episodes and I love getting a chance uh, to ask more individual um, or have individuals ask questions and for me to go a little deeper into my responses. And today there are two questions that I think many people experience and so that's why I was really happy to see these questions come in and get a chance to talk about them. So I think the best way to get started is just to hear the first question. Hello, Karen. My name is Mary Wright. I'm from uh, West End, North Carolina. I'd like to thank you for all you do for those of us who are out here muddling along trying to do this horse thing mostly on our, on our own. I have a Morgan Gelding uh, who's doing very nicely in uh, lower level dressage, except he has difficulty with cantering. I think that's kind of a Morgan issue. Uh, he's very obedient about it. He has nice canter departs, but he breaks frequently back to a trot and uh, he also does not seem to reach as far under his body with his hind legs as horses from other breeds do. Can you give me some suggestions of exercises that would help him with his canter and stay in the canter? Thank you so much. All right. Well, Mary, thank you for that question. Definitely a common challenge. Uh, First, I want to say, this comes up often, um, is I really want to help people not get stuck in the breedist, like don't be a breedist. <laughs> um, I think when we start saying things like, oh, it's because he's a Morgan or because he's a Frisian or because he's a whatever it is. Um, I mean, number one, it creates this limiting belief. And there are, there's so much variety within each breed um, that I found, you know, making generalizations like that isn't super helpful uh, as far as problem solving, right? Because we can really only, all we have to do to problem solve is to think about the actual individual in front of us. And at that moment, it doesn't matter what breed he is, you know, or what his bloodlines are, it's like, okay, here he is. <laughs> um, what do we do? You know, I think the where thinking about the breed comes in handy is if you're selecting a horse. So if you wanted to go out and find your competitive dressage prospect, I would probably recommend that people don't start by going to a gated horse breeder or something like that. And you know, there definitely can be um, some big categories, you know, to use that same example, if someone came to me and said, my horse was a, you know, a terrible canter, and he's a, you know, a gated horse. Now I know some gated horses canter very nicely. So please gated horses, people don't send me a million emails. But just in general, I'd be like, you know, okay, this might make sense. Um, but I think I think to I I tend to shy away from the it's because he's a this breed. 
And, and I don't think it's helpful. So I think let's just forget it's because he's a Morgan because I've seen some Morgans with really amazing canners. You know, Frisians all often get put in that category too because many um, were not bred to have good dressage canners, but now some are. And one of the still to this day best canters I've ever ridden was on a Frisian. And some of the worst ones are on Frisians too. So just forget that he's a Morgan. Let's just look at this individual in front of us and see how we can improve it. Because otherwise, you know, you don't want me to give an answer like, well, he's a Morgan. So, you know, <laughs> it'll never happen. No, I'm going to say we can always find ways to make things better. Okay, I will get off my soapbox about that. So thoughts that pop into my head with this question are, um, number one, what is this canner like by nature? Like when he's free, when he's out in a pasture or in, a, in an arena and you let him loose, what is this canter like? Does he keep going or does he break on his own even free? Because that's going to give you some insight into, you know, whether how much you as a rider are influencing the canner. Now, sometimes we can influence it positively and sometimes we influence it negatively. <laughs> and that's just the reality. It happens to all of us. So it's just good information. I might spend a, more time online and just go, well, what do I see? I'd also be thinking about, is the horse trying to keep going, but he gets really unorganized? Or is it lack of motivation or commitment? So for example, Sometimes you can send a horse out online and they're like got lots of energy and they're going and going and going, but then they get discombobulated and they cross fire behind and then they're all a mess and then they trot because they became a mess. <laughs> you know, or sometimes you have a horse with a beautiful canner and they just kind of go like a quarter way around the circle and they're like, well, that's enough. I think I'm starting to perspire, <laughs> you know. So you want to try to get your a read of is it a you know is it a discombobulation issue, balance issue, crookedness issue, pain issue, something like that, or is it just a lack of commitment? And sometimes if it's been a chronic issue, it can be hard to tell because they just get into a pattern. But just kind of shift your focus and see if you can figure out you know, how you would answer that. So when we start to do problem solving, here are some things, because I don't know the answer to the, those questions, but here's some things to think about. See if you can give him more opportunity to practice cantering without you on top of him. So um, online or in a round pen or just send them out in the arena. Sometimes I just send my horses loose and I go, go. <laughs> and I just let them like move and kind of clean their carburetor or something like that. Can you send him over small jumps? You know, sometimes doing little cross rail grids or, or jumps, you know, if sometimes if they're into that, then they'll start to like, oh, that's fun. And they'll move towards the jump or they kind of get going a little bit afterwards and, and cut loose a little bit. And that can really help them get moving. So something, um, something that might inspire him, make it easier for him to move. And then when riding him, you know, with any rider, we have to go, okay, well, what might I be doing to get in the way? So we want to look at our position and address major issues. So major issues such as oh my God, I'm clamping my legs on him and I never even realized I was doing that. Or um, any kind of tension, like you might have, I know for a while I had some trouble with my back and I had pain in my back. And even after the pain went away, I found myself kind of perching. Like my body was like, no, don't, don't sit down and flow. And I felt, I, I was realizing there was all this held tension in there and it's taken a while to kind of get rid of that. So See if you can find any major things. The other thing that might be happening too is some riders get in a cycle of they want their horse to go, but they keep breaking and they get a little bit intimidated by 
saying, hey, come on, keep going. So in their mind, they're going, keep going. Oh, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, well, we'll just try it again instead of going, hey, come on. <laughs> you know. So it might be a confidence thing or a worry about what happens if he does put some energy in and keep going. Like maybe he'll buck a little bit or kick out if I tap him. And sometimes then riders get in a little bit of a conflict of they want him to go, but they kind of don't want him to go. So those would all be like big rocks in the river. So kind of sit yourself down and go, all right, is, are there any of those things majorly getting in the way? Like when he canters, do you lose your balance and accidentally pull on the reins? So, um, but, you know, so look at those, but I don't, I don't want to tell you to try to be perfect in your position because like we're, none of us are perfect, but a lot of us are in a good enough category, right? So that's why I want you to get rid of the obvious, big, blatant things that might be totally causing him to break. But if you don't feel like there's anything like that going on, I want to caution riders against trying to be perfect because sometimes that just creates more tension and bodies get more rigid. So I want you to kind of, if you think that you've got like a good enough position and you're pretty confident to go, then just go, you know what, horse, I might not be perfect, but I'm good enough. And I think you should be able to canter with me on you. <laughs> so cut yourself a break. And, and I'm saying that in the spirit of, you know, don't be hard on yourself, relax, go with it. And know that it's probably, if you think it's fair, reasonable, and possible for him to canter with you on him, then let's get it done. So how, you know, how can we help? We want to be able to sit in a way that we can follow them. So um, something else I would look at is, are there more inspiring environments? So maybe in the arena, it's hard, but do you feel comfortable going out on the trail? and cantering them out there or in a field, you know, some, somewhere you feel really safe and confident to do it, but where the horse might be a little bit more inspired and be like, oh, yay. Sometimes finding um, a gentle uphill is a great place to build your confidence cantering and to extend the duration because horses will tend to want to canter up a hill and they'll also tend to stop at the top of the hill. So it's a really great uh, confidence building situation for both horse and rider. You can get up in two point, get in jumping position, get off their back and let them canter up the hill. It's building strength. It's building an uphill balance, literally. <laughs> and like I said, they, they um, tend to want to stop when you get to the top. So you can walk down the hill and then canter up the hill. Um, let's see. In a, another kind of general guideline for, for most things, but this applies here really well, is find the easiest circumstance to be successful and then make bigger improvements there. And so that's why I'm saying, you know, see if you can find an inspiring area, go online, do jumps, because that's an, if it's if it's like one notch easier for the horse, then you can raise your standard. And it's, it's not really making things harder. It's just raising your standard at an easier version of it. So instead of it has to be a working canter on a 20 meter circle in the arena, maybe that's a challenge, but make it easier, more fun and go, okay, now we're going to, yes, we're going to canter the whole hill. <laughs> we're going to canter all the way from this tree to that tree. So that brings up um, the idea of setting goals and being able to measure. So when you pick up the canter, how far does he usually go before he breaks? Measure it, pay attention, because then you can, usually there's a pattern, there's a certain number of strides or a certain place in the arena. And then whenever you figure out that pattern, then you go, okay, my new goal is half a side of the arena further than that or you know if it if he breaks after one time around the circle we're going to go one and a half times around and you're going to really commit to that and when you 
commit to that, you're going to forgive yourself if it's a little bit messy. So, you know, let's say he does one circle, but then you know he's going to break as he starts the second circle. Then you're going to commit to absolutely positively a circle and a half. And when he gets after the one circle, when you start feeling him thinking about breaking, you're going to go, keep going like your life depends on it. And he might go, whoa, mom. And he might cross fire and get unbalanced and kick out once and go, whoa, usually don't, you know, usually don't make me do that. And does, that's okay. And then when you get to the one and a half circle mark, then you just praise him and stop and go, thank you so much for that beautiful effort you just put in. That was kind of a mess. I guess we need to practice it again, <laughs> right? But if you measure it and you have those markers, then you can start to identify not only the pattern, but your successes. And you go, woohoo, we went half a circle longer. And then the next time, you know, if he one and a half circles gets to be easy, then you go, let's go, you know, let's go for two. <laughs> and, and you can m literally measure your success. Uh, another part of this that I just sort of snuck in there is um, noticing, if you start to notice the pattern, you can notice the when he's about to think about breaking. And you're allowed to make the correction there. So, you know, they usually have a thought, then they start to set them out, themselves up for the thought that they want to do, and then they do it. And a lot of times, um, writers sometimes don't notice when they're starting to break, or they notice it, but they don't really become aware or do anything about it. And then the horse breaks, and then they correct the horse afterwards, and it's, it's too late. So see if you can tune into not only after he breaks, but what does he feel like before he breaks? And what does he feel like before he feels like breaking when he's thinking about breaking? And you're going to have to be smarter, clever, quicker, and more effective in that moment to go, nope, in case you're wondering, don't think like that. You know, so is if your horse is going around asking a question going, is it okay if I break? You got to be really quick with your answer. Now, some horses are pretty sneaky and you can't feel it coming. I, I know those horses. And that's when the measuring really comes into play. And sometimes with those horses, you just have to go, you know, um, you may or may not be thinking of breaking, but let me just reinforce that we're, we're going to keep cantering. Everything is at the canter. And then um, the, f the flip side of that, because this is all about kind of feeling it ahead of time, being effective and saying, you are going to go to this other point. So that's one way to do it. The other side as more of a, a gymnastic approach. So the ones I just described are kind of leadership based. They're kind of, you know, this is my idea and you're going to join me in it, sides of it, which I think is necessary. Um, but the other side of that coin is to treat it like a gymnastic issue and say, all right, you said the canter departs are actually good. So let's take the thing that's working already and see if we can use that to improve the duration. So you might get on a pattern, whether it's on a circle or using the whole arena, whichever feels easier, straight lines or circles, and say, I'll just use the circle for an example. We'll say every time we, plat we pass 12 o'clock on the circle, I'm going to do a transition either up or down. So at 12 o'clock, I go from trot to canter. And then the next time I go to 12 o'clock, I go from canter to trot. And then the next time, same thing, same place. Um, you could also do it by counting strides. You could say, I'm going to pick up the canter. I'm going to count 10 strides of canter and then I'm going to do a transition back to the trot. And then I'm going to get organized. And as soon as I feel ready, I'm going to canter to part, count 10 strides and go back to the trot. You could do transitions at 6 and 12 o'clock. And the idea is to put a good transition in there before he gets a chance to do his own transition. 
And if you can do it, then you get a chance to work on the quality. So the other exercises were about increasing duration. This is about increasing quality. And in doing those transitions, transitions are collectability exercises, which tend to create engagement, which is, you know, the hind end carrying more. So um, that's, that's how I would approach it. I would say I want to own the transitions by doing them on my schedule. And then on other days, you can say, okay, today is, we're not going to worry about quality. I'm going to worry about duration. Right. So two sets of exercise. One is duration. Just go. I don't care how messy it is. We're going to go to this further marker. And the other side is quality. You're not going to extend the duration. You're just going to extend the quality of the canter by doing more frequent trans transitions. All right. Well, I hope that helps. And um, uh, Mary, since you're in the video classroom, you can always leave a comment in our Facebook group there and let me know how that helps. Okay, so let's go on to the next question, which is from uh, Carrie, and I'll just play her question. Hi, Karen. I'm wondering if bulking and running away are basically uh, two polar opposites of the same issue. And uh, also wondering how to work through uh, the bulking issue in particular. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> that is a, a common and often very tricky dynamic. So this bulk and then um, I'll say explosion, some sort of version of, of the opposite of bulking. <laughs> right. So... Um, some of the the kind of creepiest moments I've had on horses have been when they're standing still, when they aren't moving, and and it's it's not that they're not moving. It's it's just the what's going to happen next. What happens when they do start moving? That can be really tricky. And you know when horses are moving, sometimes we have something to work with. We know what we got. Uh, it's not as complicated mentally, I find. But when they're just frozen standing there, you know, all you're left with is what are they thinking? And that's one of the hardest things to figure out. So yes, those two things are definitely related. And they, um, although not necessarily. So horses can balk for several reasons. One of them is out of fear, right? So um, you hear a lot about fight or flight, and people don't often mention the other F, which is freeze. So it's flight, <laughs> fight, or freeze. And so the horses that freeze are doing it from, and they're doing it from fear, um, they, they often don't stay frozen forever, right? <laughs> They just freeze and then often something else happens, whether it's running away or leaping in the air or something. Uh, so the another reason why a horse might balk is um, it's a learned pattern for avoidance. So something about their riding experience or maybe they do even do it on the ground, but something about the experience makes them go, nope, <laughs> not signing up for that. Nope, can't make me. Uh, and it's, it's, those horses are, I mean, they're emotional in that they're feeling, I don't want to do that. They're feeling an emotion of um, dislike or, you know, frustration or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but it's, they're often thinking, you know, they're like, nope, I am making a choice here because whatever you do to me when I'm not going is not nearly as bad as what happens when I do. And that can be, that can, it can be very effective. <laughs> you know, anyone who's ridden a bulky horse is reminded of like, oh, we actually don't have that much control and they can actually do whatever they want if they really want to. Um, so it's a very humbling <laughs> problem. Uh, so um, that's another reason. One more reason I've seen that horses can balk is um, 
I find a certain percentage of horses just kind of have an innate uh, opposition reflex to pressure. And where when they're met, when they feel any kind of pressure and especially like legs closing on them to ask them to go forward, their first response or reaction is to block and shut down. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell whether it's a learned pattern of avoidance or um, an, an inherent opposition reflex, unless you've known the horse from the very beginning, um, then you can kind of know for sure. Uh, the fear balking usually is easy to tell um, that they're in fear unless they are an extreme introvert. And then those ones can be pretty tricky because sometimes their heart rate doesn't even go up. So that is when it gets really tricky. So um, the, the other important thing to know about bulkiness is that the bulkiness is not the problem. The problem is not that they're stopped. That's a symptom. The problem is whatever it is that made them stop. So a lot of times people just address the bulkiness as if it's the problem and they address any bulking with a, hey, you got to go and you got to keep going and I can make you keep going. And it's more of a submissiveness through dominance kind of approach. And um, that usually it maybe you can get them going, but it usually doesn't change their mind about why they wanted to stop in the first place. And if their reason for not wanting to go in the first place is big enough, it will actually make the problem worse. They'll just be, they're like, you see, I knew it. I knew it was going to be bad if I went. And they're just going to try harder to stop next time. So we've got to be really clever um, in working with these kind of horses and trying to turn it around. And it's usually a long-term process of chipping away and building the trust and the partnership along the way. If it was as easy as just smack them on the butt and keep going, it wouldn't be a problem. And, you know, sometimes a horse that has maybe learned it and maybe they had a rider that taught them that prop that, um, that, you know, that was ineffective and kind of not taught them that pattern, but let that pattern develop. That's the kind of thing where, you know, okay, maybe the trainer can get on and just go, Hey, come on, this is not what we do. And the horse goes, okay, you got me. Right. So that's, that's usually not a problem, though. That's just a little bit of a sticky horse that needs a tune-up every now and then. Um, but these problems can go um, much deeper. If you, if you decide, so the, here's the two choices. Um, when they're stopped, you can wait or you can say, oh, no, 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 we need to move. And sometimes one works and sometimes the other works. So I think that's one of the conscious choices you can make is go, I'm going to choose to just be calm and wait and see what happens, or I'm going to be effective. And you've got to really do it one way or the other, because if you do it kind of halfway, then you're not really doing either one of those. And uh, I've, I've met some really strange horses in my life. <laughs> there was one that was quite explosive. It was actually the horse that started my kind of professional career because um, I had horses that, I had a horse that bucked a lot. And my trainer um, uh, called me at one point because there was a horse that was bucking everybody off and he was very odd. Um, and he had gone through all her trainers and she called me in. And this was a very strange horse, but before he would, he would either just buck or he would balk first and he would um, like go put his head against the arena wall and just stop and, uh, or go like drag me into a tree and then just stop. And it was a really creepy feeling and it gave me the feeling that if I touched him, he would explode. So I just sat there. <laughs> I just, I saw every other trainer get thrown off this horse. I'm just going to sit here and see what happens. And I just waited 
and waited and waited and waited and everybody was riding around me I said don't mind me I'm just gonna sit here and pretty soon the horse would just go I can't remember what I was fighting against and then he he just start to go again so that's an example of just waiting to see you know see what happens and be non-confrontational but again the reason he was doing it because he didn't like the way he was being ridden and he didn't like the confrontation. So I took away all the confrontation and he realized I wasn't going to fight him. And pretty soon after over time, it took this horse about three months before he stopped trying to do weird things. Um, and uh, he ended up going on and being sold and being really successful, but it took just dissolving, eliminating the reason. I was like, I am not going to confront you. I never will. And pretty soon he's like, you're pretty cool. I guess I don't have to defend myself by stopping. So there's that. But there's other horses that we need to be really effective in, in when they start to shut down. If we go, oh, oh, no, 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 no. M your feet are mine. And we want to keep them moving. And if we do that, you've got to be super fast, super quick, super early, and super effective so that you can get control over their feet faster than they can stop and just keep them moving, keep them moving, keep them moving. And even if it's just a hindquarter yield, forequarter yield or sideways or something, even if you have to get off, sometimes I'll, I'll try that technique and I can't be effective right away in the saddle. And I'm like, oh, oh, they might rear, they might start doing something else weird. I'll just, oh, that's not working in the saddle. That's fine. I'm going to get off. I'm going to move, 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 move. And then I'll get back on and see what they want to do right so once you decide to be effective you got to be effective and i don't mean hard i just mean persistent effective change your positioning try it a different way get off if you need to you know you, but you're going to say i can move your feet All right so that's that's one way to deal in the moment with the thing but it still doesn't address the why did they do it in the first place, right? So those two techniques that I just said, either wait or get effective, will save you, those are choices to do in this moment to stay safe and choose whichever one is gonna keep you safest. For some horses, like that first horse I described, doing nothing and just waiting was the safest thing I could do because I knew if I touched him, he'd buck me off. <laughs> But for another horse who maybe got into a pattern of rearing or, or running off, then the safest thing to do would be to get his feet moving and get him in a hindquarter yield or something like that where you got control. All right, so now what do we do? What about why did he balk in the first place? So if it's fear, you have to try to figure out, is it fear of a thing? Or is it fear of a situation? And so, and you know, we're just guessing because we don't really know what's exactly in their minds, but that's what I would think of. Is it a thing or is it a situation? If it's a thing, then that's easy. It, you can do confidence building with things, approach and retreat and let them sniff it and desensitization and, you know, all counter conditioning and all kinds of things like that. If it's a situation like, or even an environment like the arena. I have a horse right now who's much more tense in the arena. So I do all, you know, I do dressage and gymnastic and riding stuff, but I also do a lot of counter conditioning. We go to the arena a lot of times when I'm not going to be riding. And I bring other horses in there and we hang out, we do silly horse tricks. So there's a lot of homework involved in in the overcoming fear and changing the emotions and you've got to look at that other layer and go if it's fear what are they afraid of and how can i start to approach that whatever that thing is and turn around their idea and that takes some time and it takes some dedication um in the most recent video classroom so this would be october 2020, uh, there's some videos. If you click on the um, video label for Teo, um, Teo is a horse, extreme introvert, gets nervous, freezes, but then has a history of explosion. And, um, and I do not want to ride the explosion. 
So with him, it's a little, I've played with both the waiting at certain times and with moving his feet in the beginning because we didn't know each other and he didn't trust me. I had to wait. And I say, don't worry, I am not going to be an additional source of reasons for you to freeze. Um, now that we know each other better, I'm using much more the, um, hey, move your feet when I ask. And so there's a video of yielding for relaxation and yielding for attention in the October 2020 um, classroom. And if you look at the other videos on Teo, um, there's another one earlier that was called uh, decision making when riding. And you'll see how I, he's going back and forth from a fear um, balk where I just sit there and wait for a second and, and a just, hey, I'm kind of tired and I feel like stopping balk where I ask him to do something. So I think that could be really interesting um, for you to watch in the video classroom. Um, okay, so now, if it's a learned avoidance, um, then you're going to, you're going to, you know, they're thinking, they're not afraid. They just say, hey, what happens when I move kind of stinks. So I'm going to just not move. <laughs> so then it's really about getting your communication effective, clear, and being worthy of being talked to. So lots of, um, rewarding. So you have to figure out what is it that they're trying to avoid and how do we change their mind about it? So it's, it's not so much about emotions. It's about what they're thinking. They're being pessimistic, right? They're going, this is probably going to really suck. So I'm just not going to do it. So we want to be able to get their feet moving, but it's what we do after that that really counts. So that after they get their feet moving, we're like, yay, isn't that fun and easy? And look, all I wanted you to do is three steps and I'm going to give you a cookie. Ha ha, surprise. <laughs> right? So many of these types of horses are trained in a way that it's like, don't let them stop. Keep them going. Don't let them fall asleep. And it just proves to them that it's going to be terrible. So we want to make a big effort that they try to do something because I'm the mommy and I said so and that's why. But then after they sign up for that, we go, oh, just kidding. I was just checking to see if you would, but that's fine. Thank you for showing me that you would. And we have to do big rewards and not overwork these horses. Maybe we're in the arena, they balk. We get them moving. Come on, hind quarter, hind quarter, four quarter, four quarter. As soon as they take a step forward, we go, yay. And we just walk out of the arena. Just kidding. <laughs> so there's um, a video in the video classroom, June 2013, called um, something like getting free forward energy on a horse that shuts down. And that's where I show this technique. When she stops, I have the student just go, nope, move it, move it, move it, move it, move it. And as soon as she's going straight and forward, we go, Wee! We just leave the arena and go out in the field and big rewards for small efforts. And we just prove that when they're going, we're not going to go, ha ha, now that you're going, I'm going to make you do it. Now, I've met lots of horses that have um, gotten into this balking thing. And now I, the horses that I'm going to tell you about, I did not know from the beginning. So I'm they could just have this innate opposition reflex, but because of how much they transformed and when I changed their mind about things, how freely forward they went, I'm going to be, I'm guessing that it really wasn't an innate um, characteristic. It was a learned behavior. So um, one of these was a horse named um, Caleb that came into training. He was actually um, for, um had done some dressage, but it was an event prospect and jumping. And same thing, like I'd go into the arena and if I closed my leg, he, he could pretty well just stop. Um, so I had to be really loose and fun with them. It was with horses like this, you have to be really careful not to just clamp your legs. Don't, don't ever get caught pushing. You've got to stay really relaxed in your seat fluffy with your legs, fluffy little bumpy fluttery things, 
don't squeeze because once you squeeze and nothing comes out, now you're just constipated writing, right? You, you can't just keep squeezing. It's just now you're, now it's tension and you're going to actually shut them down and close the valve. So you have to be very, very loose, very fluffy. Come on, ready. Here we, here we go. Um, and the communication style, um, I, I get really into doing tricks with these kind of horses of like, hey, there's a cue and then you do something and then you get a cookie. Isn't this awesome? Um, but anyway, so with Caleb, we had kind of worked it out and he was going quite well. And then I brought him to someone to try as an event prospect and they rode him quite well. I was really proud of him. And then um, they, they said, well, has he ever done water? And I was like, I don't know. So they brought him to this water jump and he just stopped. And this six foot guy with big spurs on just was digging in and I'm watching and I'm like, you know, don't push, just give him a second. Just give him a second. I don't know if he's ever done this before. And uh, the trainer was there saying, yeah, don't push him. But on the meantime, he was pushing him. He was tapping him on the butt. He was digging spurs in. And then I'm just watching going, oh, what am I going to do about this? She, the trainer gets up to get the dressage whip to get behind him. And I went, stop. I was like, can I just, can I just take him for a second? So <laughs> I took him back. I put him online. I presented him to the water. He stopped and I waited. And after like 15 seconds, he took a step forward. I said, good. I gave him a cookie. I waited. I represented. And in about 30 more seconds, he was in the water and I could canter him online through the water. And they're just looking at me like, you know, the guy was like, oh, that was cool. What'd you do? And I said, I did what you guys were saying, which was don't push him. <laughs> so, you know, don't get caught pushing these horses. You cannot just directly make them go if a horse has decided to stop. Um, <laughs> now, there was another horse also, this horse, um, Phoenix. It was a horse owned by a dressage judge, and he was probably like fourth pre-St. George. Oh, he's probably trained beyond that, actually. And he had a really bulky, balk, balking with a rear. And same thing. I just had to, you know, get, say, you got to move something. And as soon as he moved something, I just went, see, that's it. Nothing. Um, very, very patient with him. Um, and then there was one time when I was pushing and he went to balk and I gave him a little tap and he reared straight up and I thought, oh boy, you know, how am I going to handle this? And I just started petting him and I said, good boy, good boy, good boy. That was such a good rear, you know, non-confrontational because he was used to being criticized and he landed from that rear and gave a big snort and then he started passaging all over the place and I just kept rubbing him, telling him it was fantastic and then we just did a free walk. And from that moment forward, he was loose. So I think these horses just have this real conflict in them of, I want to go, but I don't like what's going to happen if I do. And then it gets, the energy gets stuck. So it's, you've got to be really very interesting blend of, I can be effective if I want to. And at the same time, I'm going to honor you and I'm not going to push you. So those are two really challenging things to hold in your mind at the same time. Be really relaxed in your butt, really relaxed and lighthearted in your attitude and figure out for that each horse, what's the blend of you need to move yet I'll give you time. And that's what makes it tricky because every horse is different. So, um, Carrie had, because it took me so long to answer this question in the podcast, I had emailed her some of these suggestions and she, she wrote back recently and said that she's watched that video June 2013 in the video classroom about a hundred times and she said it's really making good progress. So that's super cool. Um, okay, so the other reason why a horse might uh, be balky is opposition reflex and a certain percentage of horses just have this tendency um, they're born with it and um, it's just the way they are 
and I happen to have one of those horses. So my horse, Solana, and there's a little of a genetic component in that her, um, her father's bloodline has a little tendency of this. She's, uh, her father is Sandro Hitt Oldenburg, and uh, they're known for being um, either fantastic or very beautifully standing still or rearing in the middle of the arena. <laughs> so she doesn't do that. She's pretty mild mannered, but from the very beginning, when I touched her with my leg, she would stop very effectively. And I thought, oh boy, she's never going to be a dressage horse because they really, dressage horses need to be very open to this suggestion of AIDS going through their body. And um, horses with this, it'll show up early and it can really persist. So with Solana, it's still there. In fact, this year, I mean, she's schooling pre-St. George now. She's going fantastically. I'm thrilled with her. She and I have really worked it out. But I put another rider on her this year, and I mean, she couldn't even get her to pick up the canner. And um, it was kind of funny, but kind of not. Uh, these horses, you need to you need to really work it out with them on a very personal basis. So these kind of horses, you know, like I said, she goes fantastically for me. We've worked it out, but it's right there. Like you put somebody else on her and they squeeze too hard and they'll just, they just will shut down. So the, these ones are tricky, uh, tricky to train, but can be really satisfying if it's your horse and you guys work it out. They're, they're kind of one one people horses, or at least one at a time. Um, you've got to really get into their minds and work out the agreement with them. It's, it's still a blend of sometimes you need to move because I said so, and a blend of that with, I promise, you know, motivational kind of stuff. I promise when you do go for me, it's not going to be that bad, but it's a lot about your own rider biomechanics, any tension in your seat, any tension in your leg, anywhere in your body, even in your brain can shut it down. I mean, Solano would be going along in this beautiful trot. And if I just like apply the aids for the canner, 80% of the time it won't work. <laughs> and I'll try it again. I'll try it again. And then in the, in between aids, I'll like be taking my aids off to get ready to ask again. And she just goes, I'm going to can her now. <laughs> She's like, I don't want to be asked to can her. I just want to can her. So I realized like I have to send her a little mental message of can her. I'm like, do you want to can her ready? And just saying it that way has a much higher percentage chance of success than me just applying my can her signal. So um, you've got to be super, super clever and do not overuse your body. It's much more like, um, what's the analogy? Uh, herding geese. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> Rather than go. <laughs> um, yeah. So the rule of thumb for all of these horses is do not push when they're balking. Or be so super effective so quickly and be so committed to it that you are going to be effective. Getting stuck in between is the worst to be kind of asking and not really getting. That, you'd be better to sit there and do nothing <laughs> and just wait than to be caught pushing and only getting 20% or pushing and getting nothing. And, you know, again, with these, with, if you have an introverted horse who's fearful, then be very, very cautious because those ones are really hard to read. And those are the ones that have the explosion. Um, however, it shows up, it can show up as taking off. It can show up as bucking. It can show up as rearing. It can, you know, it can show up in all sorts of ways, but it's that, you know, if you're, if you're thinking, if you feel any kind of fear in that situation, you'd be better off to just wait or get off and get something moving, see what happens, than to be um, 
to be asking and asking and asking and nothing's happening because all you're doing is you're you're adding pressure you're adding pressure you're adding pressure and it's already a pressure cooker and it's going to come out at some point so um, do your best to see if you can identify if it's introverted fear if it's extroverted fear they they probably don't freeze for too long and you can get them moving um, but the introverted fear is is the hardest case scenario um, for any horse in these categories I love to have a few silly horse tricks up my sleeve things that um, you know go stand in the tub I have these rubber tubs and I love to have these around so go stand in the tub because it anytime there's a trick go touch your nose on this pick your foot up put your nose over here stand on this thing turns on a different part of their brain it helps them think it gives them something very simple and easy to do because it's so simple and easy to do if you've already trained it you'll be able to tell the emotional state because if they're so afraid that they can't do this simple trick that you know that they know how to do then that's a really good warning of how not thinking they are and then you have to really make sure you stay safe um, if it's a horse with a learned pattern of avoidance, it can change their mind and go, oh, I thought we were going to do hard stuff. Foot in the bucket? Let's do that. Cookies, cookies, cookies. And now you've got them in a different mindset. And now you might be able to get them going. Well, let's trot over to there and go in that bucket. Okay, that sounds good. And there's a um, video in the classroom, if you click on Ovation, where I, it's called uh, Creating Enthusiasm. I forget the month. Um, if you click on ovation videos you'll find it or there's actually a video label called enthusiasm and i have him going to jump jumps to then put his foot in the bucket so things like that can break the cycle of i'm i'm just stuck uh, so i hope that helps and again you guys are both in the video classroom so um, definitely post in the facebook group let me know how these questions help you and um, that's it so um, until the next time uh, I'll, I'll let you know when we need more questions and uh, people in the classroom always get first dibs. All right, guys. I hope that helps. <laughs>